Hello, and welcome to the Kevin Mannix Report. I'm Kevin Mannix, your host for this program, and we're glad to have you with us. This program is designed to give us all a little more insight into people who are involved in government and politics in the community. And our show today has got someone on board who is more involved in government than politics because he's in a judicial position, so it's his job to decide cases. We have the presiding judge from the Workers' Compensation Board Hearings Division, John McCullough. Good morning. Nice Welcome to, to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. One of the things we try to do on the program is give folks a chance to understand a little more about the real people who are behind the titles and sometimes the headlines. And so I always like to ask a few questions about background. Can you give us some idea where you're from, where you grew up, that sort of thing? Sure. I grew up in Salem uh, through high school, then uh, was out of the state for college and uh, law school, and then for a few years of practice uh, after I got out of law school. So but better part of my life's been in the uh, Salem, you know, Portland area. Now, when you mentioned being out of state, was that in California? Uh, mostly, yeah. yeah. I was actually the, the decade of the 70s, you might say. I was in California, and then uh, my family and I moved up here in 1979 uh, uh, for me and my wife, actually. We wanted to, she had gone to Lewis and Clark for college, so we both had roots here and wanted to get back to Oregon, and California was getting a little crowded. But when you were uh, growing up, did you have any notion that you wanted to be a lawyer at some time? Uh, well, my father is a lawyer, so I probably thought about that, you know, but I, I always, through high school, I always seemed to do reasonably well and was interested in science and math and kind of had the thought that maybe I'd go into be an engineer of some kind, but uh, uh, after I got out of high school, the first year of differential equations in college <laughs> changed my mind and got me going in more of a social sciences direction. So what was your college education like for you after that first year? Uh, a, a mix of, you know, the humanities, social science courses, um, uh, some science and uh, courses beyond that. And I got, had a couple, actually a couple law courses um, before law school that got me interested in constitutional law and just a kind of a basic law overview class that I took. And uh, Is that what caused you to start thinking about it or yeah, were you actually, already thinking no, I, about it? I think it, it that probably was it. Uh, at, uh, I was more in a political science major, international affairs major, and but uh, the uh, exposure to law, you know, just the basic contracts towards, you know, criminal law, um, and then the special course in constitutional law got me interested in legal issues and you know that kind of uh, conceptual thinking, and uh, uh, that point about mid midway in my senior year, I thought law school is what I wanted to do. Uh, so it's a way to about. help people. I wanted to be able to, you know, do something of service uh, and and apply, you know, analytical tools, legal analysis, uh, those sorts of things interested me. And I thought law would be a way to, uh, you know, actually, you know, earn a living and do something uh, helpful. You know. Can you tell us a little about your law school experience? What that was like? Um, I went to, you know, I was in. Uh, uh, Berkeley, California, uh, University of California School of Law there, and uh, it, was a, it was a fairly uh, turbulent time, 1970 to 73. So uh, I had a, my exposure was to law and, and a lot of other things. I mean, there was a lot of things going on in the world of politics, international affairs, and you know that part of California. There's a lot of you know, st you know student interest, and uh, so it was a it was a busy time. I uh, it was a busy time to learn about uh, the various areas of law, but also to get uh, interested and more involved in the social action, uh, community service types of activities. Uh, kind of got me interested in the idea of you know, going into an area of law which ended up for me being workers' compensation where I you know, felt I could uh, use my you know, legal training to try and be of some benefit to uh, the community. Now, in terms of that law career that you're heading towards, uh, you mentioned workers' compensation. That's a, a particular area of the law that deals with injuries on the job or diseases that you contract through your work. Right. Um, as I recall, you practiced workers' compensation for a while in California until about 1979? That's correct. I was in pr private practice for about four years in the uh, San Francisco, Oakland area with a small firm uh, representing injured workers. and. Ninety percent or so of my practice in the firm was workers' compensation. So, uh, how did you find the practice? Um, I mean, how did I get into how it, or how did I like the? Well, practice? actually, I guess yeah. both versions yeah. of how did you find it. Did you like it, and how did you get into it? Uh, I I got into the air of workers' comp because. Uh, 
Well, a couple reasons. My father was uh, working in that field. He had, uh, for a long time, he'd worked for the state of Oregon in different capacities, including with the Supreme Court for about 10 years in the 60s. But then he got a position as a, what was called a referee at the time with the Workers' Comp Board in 71. So through him, I was exposed to it. And, you know, read a few books on Workers' Comp, including the uh, uh, portions of Professor Larson's treatise and the uh, CLE book, continuing legal education book that California offered in workers' comp, and it got me interested in it. The uh, combination of medical and legal uh, concepts, I think, intrigued me the most. Uh, it was just an interesting uh, substantive area of law. And it seemed like a, an area that where you could do some good, you know, be of some help to people. Did you decide at some point that you wanted to come back to Oregon? Is that why the transition in 79? Correct. There are a couple of things that work there. One, I, I think as I was practicing law, I found myself more and more interested in the idea of being in the middle, you know, being a judge where you hear the evidence from both sides and you know, uh, review the law and, and try and reach a, you know, a good decision if, as best you can. And rather than being on one side or the other, I just felt drawn toward that. And um, there were some opportunities I'd learned about in Oregon uh, in the latter part of 1978, some openings. And my wife and I, for some time, had talked about at some point wanting to get back to Oregon, like I, I think indicated before. And it was just it was a good timing for us. And there was a chance to uh, an opening with the Workers' Comp Board as a uh, hearings referee. So I, I went for it and got lucky. and, and uh, uh, got appointed. Well, at this point, we should probably talk a little bit about the system that you're in and that you were in, actually, that you've been in since 1979. Mm -hmm. the, the system is separate from our regular trial courts where people think of the judiciary. And uh, this is administrative law, so it's within the executive branch of government, but it is an adjudication process. And I know we've used various titles. Administrative law judge is, is a legal title now, and I also thought generically it's always been the most apt title. Yeah, I agree. Originally you were called a referee or hearings referee. Right. But it was your job to hear cases where people would come in, the injured workers would come in, and the uh, employers or insurance companies would come in, and they had a variety of issues. Can you explain the kinds of issues that you had to decide, uh, that you continue to decide sure. as an administrative law judge? Now, basically, just as a brief preface, I don't like I think you, I've always viewed uh, our system and the hearings division as really, I liken it to <coughs> a circuit court trial in front of the judge. There's simply no jury. Uh, the parties come in and uh, present their evidence to the uh, judge, and the judge is the uh, finder of fact and the uh, uh, determiner of what the applicable law is and how you apply the law to the facts. Everything that a judge would do in circuit court when, when there isn't a jury, and that's what I think sometimes called a court trial. Um, the kinds of issues that we have traditionally heard and continue to hear are largely, uh, increasingly in the last few years, in the area of compensability issues, and that is whether whether a claim for uh, an injury or an occupational disease that a worker makes is uh, entitled, you know, merits compensation under the workers' compensation system. Uh, and there are a lot of sub-issues to that. You have the question of did the person, uh, was the person acting in the course and scope of his employment at the time he got hurt? That can sometimes be an issue uh, versus being outside the scope. Uh, another issue can be whether the injury happened at all. You get disputes about that. Then. And the injured worker claims that something happened, that an accident took place, and the employer contends that it didn't. And so you get credibility issues there. You also get issues involving uh, where there's no dispute about there having been an accident and it was at work, but whether or not the medical condition the worker is seeking treatment for is causally related to what happened at work uh, versus some pre-existing condition that the uh, uh, worker may have had. Um, In other words, the workers' comp system doesn't become the general health insurer for someone just because you have an injury. You have to show that whatever medical treatment you're getting is tied to that injury That's or correct. occupational yeah. disease. The causal relationship has always been a key, you know, it's a key ingredient in, in most workers' comp cases. Once in a while, there's no dis dispute about that, but the dispute is about something else. But, uh, you know, but uh, the causal connection between the medical condition and the uh, job conditions um, is critical. And, and I'd say currently, 
That's 70, 75 percent of the kinds of issues that we adjudicate at the hearings division involve some sort of compensability issue. Uh, and I say that as distinct from uh, other, the other category of issues we primarily do, and that is questions of uh, the extent of disability the person has. And if they have a permanent disability, how much under a fairly you know, complicated system of rating that's been developed. That's to, uh, to de determine the award of dollars for right, permanent disability? Right, the benefits that they get for that permanent disability. Uh, we currently, I th maybe 15, 20 percent of our cases involve that type of issue now uh, uh, in contrast with uh, earlier times in the 70s and 80s when it was maybe 30 or 40 percent. Uh, there's been some changes in the system in recent years that have uh, resulted in our division uh, having a greater focus emphasis on these compensability issues. Now when people think of the Workers' Compensation Board, uh, they may have the, the notion that it's the board that runs the insurance system or gives out the benefits. Now we did have a system at one point where we had the State Indi Industrial Accident Commission. Can you explain that transition and, and how the board and its hearings division are different today? Sure. Uh, you're right. Originally, um, up to 1965, for 40 or 50 years or more, there, there was just a state commission that uh, uh, was the insurance company and the uh, determiner of benefits, you know, deciding everything. Uh, legislature changed the system in 65, uh, set up the Workers' Compensation Board as an adjudicatory body to not be an insurer at all. The, the employers were entitled to self-insure and get private insurance uh, coverage or go with a, a safe corporation uh, for insurance. Um, and the workers' comp board was not in the insurance business at all anymore at that point. It simply was, uh, again, like a court you know, adjudicating cases. There's been some evolution in the system since then. Uh, the um, board originally in 65 not only adjudicated cases but had some regulatory authority over employers in terms of making sure they were in compliance with the law and they, the board had a division that dealt with rating disabilities and so on. In 1977 the legislature created the workers compensation department which took over those regulatory functions and the board kind of was stayed within the department on paper, but but uh, became uh, essentially an independent uh, adjudicatory body. So if I am John Q. Citizen and I fall off a ladder on the job, and the uh, employer didn't see it happen, and so he disputes it and says that I must have fallen off a ladder at home, for mm -hmm. example. Um, I get a lawyer, or I can represent myself, although. I would encourage anybody to get a lawyer with this kind of litigation. Mm -hmm. I get a lawyer who represents me and asks for a hearing because I've gotten this denial letter. Um, this is a process where the individual goes in front of a judge, an administrative law judge hired by the state, and uh, the judge conducts the hearing. Can you give us a little notion? You mentioned it's sort of like a a, a trial to the court in circuit court. Mm -hmm. um, is there, are there some efficiencies that are built into the system that have helped move these cases more quickly that you can talk about? Well, one of them, I think, is that because it's a, a trial in front of a, a, a judge, an administrative law judge who has expertise in the law and also in analysis of factual and medical issues, um, because of that, the rules of evidence are not as strict as they are in circuit court. Uh, you don't have to kind of shepherd the evidence through to you know, make sure certain things are you know, insulated from the jury, that sort of thing. Uh, the judge is uh, more, I think, from experience and uh, qualifications able to deal with uh, a broader range of evidence. So you don't have to, uh, the strict rules of evidence. The, the cases are presented a little bit more uh, efficiently and uh, you don't have to take as much time. Uh, for one example, you don't have to take half a day or more to uh, worry about impaneling a jury. I mean, you walk right in at 9 o'clock let's say on Monday morning and start your hearing. Um, the cases, the, the flow of the trial though is pretty similar I think to what someone who's experienced or sat in and watched a court trial uh, would be familiar with and that is that you, you know, the parties come in almost always with attorneys on each side because the issues are complex enough to warrant that. And uh, the judge will uh, work out what the issues are you know, with the attorneys, get the issues framed, decide on what uh, exhibits, documentary evidence is going to be put in the record. Uh, and then the lawyers present opening statements, just like you know, to a judge or jury in court. And then they present the witness, the witnesses. Um, usually it's the injured worker first, not always. And then other witnesses uh, that the parties may want to bring in, uh, co-workers, uh, spouses, that sort of thing, uh, supervisors. 
Um, and the procedure is just, again, like in a courtroom. The uh, lawyer calling the witness will ask questions, uh, maybe objections to those questions by the other lawyer, and it's the, AL, the administrative law judge's job to uh, rule on those objections. Um, and then when the uh, one lawyer is finished with the direct exam of his witness, there's cross-examination by the other lawyer, and then and so it goes until they're finished examining the witness, and then you move on to the next witness. Uh, occasionally, the ALJ will uh, interject and ask some questions also. You know, the idea being that uh, our job is to make as complete uh, and uh, illuminating a record as we can because we have to decide the case and we want to have the best and most complete information we can get. So sometimes areas maybe don't get fully covered that we feel that we need a little bit more clarification on, so the judge will ask a witness a question from time to time. Then after the witnesses are done, the lawyers present their closing argument Correct. to the judge. Yeah. And then usually these cases are taken under advisement, that is the judge goes back and reviews documents. And maybe we should explain at this point that there's a good deal of documentary evidence that's used that in a circuit court trial, you might have a doctor testify, for example, mm -hmm. or you might take a deposition of a doctor. And although that occasionally happens in these hearings, more often, in fact, virtually all the time, the doctors send in reports. Correct. They review the facts and they give their opinions, and that's used instead of live testimony or depositions. That's correct. Uh, the documentary evidence, uh, the exhibits I referred to earlier, you know, will consist of claim forms and sometimes uh, uh, letters and correspondence that pertain to the issue in some way. But the, a, a big part of the documentary record are medical records, uh, chart notes from doctors, uh, reports from the treating physician, uh, written reports from uh, uh, medical examiners the insurance company is uh, utilized to uh, examine the claimant and offer an opinion on a causation issue for example. So all those documents have to get reviewed by the ALJ you know, after the hearing is over and the lawyers have made their arguments and so on. You review all those documents, you review the testimony, uh, either on the basis of you know, copious notes that you may have taken during the hearing or sometimes uh, from a transcript of the testimony. And um, you, know, you do all that within 30 days after the record closes. Uh, by close, I mean all the evidence is in and the closing arguments have been made. And the uh, law requires the opinion in order, the d written decision to be out within 30 days. So and there's another distinction we with do. The, the general court system, because generally judges don't operate under deadlines in the general court mm -hmm. system. But the administrative law judges are supposed to keep these cases moving. That's so correct. the statute says you're supposed to decide it in 30 days. Yeah, that's one of those real bright lines, so to speak, in our system that we have to try to adhere to, that we get the, and uh, we've been very successful at that, I think. Uh, the timeliness uh, uh, rates for the ALJs in the division for the last, in the you know, recent times, and well, probably further back in time, but for the time I've been paying attention to them in my current job, uh, judges are getting them out in 90 percent of the time or more within the uh, uh, 30 day time period and those that are a little past that sometimes uh, one will get out a few days past 30 days because of various you know, con uh, contingencies that come up but uh, it's, that's one of the real important things that we try and keep focused on is we you know, want to get the decision out timely because the parties are waiting for it. We're going to pause for a moment and I'll mention to our audience that you're with us on the Kevin Mannix Report. I'm your host Kevin Mannix. Our guest today is a gentleman who is the presiding administrative law judge for the hearings division of the Workers' Compensation Board, which is an entity which decides cases involving workers' compensation, industrial injuries, and occupational diseases. If you ever have any questions or concerns at any time, I hope you feel free to write me at 2003 State Street, Salem, Oregon, 97301, or you can phone. You're, you'll normally get a voicemail message on that phone line since it's not always tended, but we'll always get back to you promptly and we're always glad to hear from you. And back to you, Judge McCullough. We were talking a little bit about this trial process. Mm -hmm. Because of the efficiencies that are built in, and again, the expertise of the judge, because the judges are dealing with workers' comp cases every day. That's correct. Um, you're able to move <coughs> these hearings usually in a few hours instead of a few days of trial, and then you have a time frame to get a decision out. Now, what happens if someone's unhappy with the decision of the judge and they want to appeal? Can you talk about that process? Sure. The, the next step, uh, again, often in our system, the, there's a reference to the workers' compensation board, like I work for the board, the ALJs work for the board. Uh, the board is the 
term for the agency, you know, in the executive branch you indicated earlier. The, but the board is also the first, is like an appellate court. The hearings division, ALJs, issue their decision at the trial level. If either party is dissatisfied with that decision, they have 30 days to file an appeal with the Workers' Compensation Board, which currently consists of five members who function as appellate judges. And they will uh, get a transcript of the uh, hearing, all the exhibits that the ALJ you know, reviewed, copy the ALJ's opinion and order, and then the attorneys for the parties will file briefs you know, on appeal to the board. You know, once all that information is put together, you know, the board uh, members, uh, with the assistance of their you know, staff attorneys, will review that file and the issues being raised on appeal, and then they issue a decision, uh, what's called an order on review, um, a written decision, um, either affirming the opinion in order, reversing it, or you know, partially affirming it, you know, modifying it. Uh, and then from there, if the party is dissatisfied with the board's decision, uh, the next step is to take an appeal to the State Court of Appeals. Now, we should mention that of the five board members, normally three will sit on a case or two will decide the case? Generally, we'll two the will do it. Yeah, you know, they'll have panels of two looking at most of the cases. And then uh, uh, currently, I believe the, the public member, who also happens to be the chair, Maureen Bach, uh, uh, will be brought in as a tiebreaker if the two can't you know, decide the case. Uh, so you end up you know, with, with three people on those decisions. Um, Cases that the board, uh, through various processes it uses, determines to be significant cases, you know, cases uh, with an issue that either a first impression or one that uh, maybe isn't first impression, it's been looked at before, but it's an important issue uh, to the system. Uh, the board will uh, look at that, uh, review that in bank, meaning all five of them will uh, review that, uh, that file, that case, and um, be part of the decision, either unanimous or split decision, whatever. So you have two shots at a review of the facts and law in a com comprehensive way. One is with the administrative law judge, and uh, I would estimate that most cases are resolved at that level, but then you can appeal to the board where at least two people will review the transcripts and all the evidence and make a fresh decision. Now when you go on to the Court of Appeals, could you talk about how that's a, a narrower review than the board review? Right. The board review is what's called de novo, meaning again, they look at the same record the ALJ looked at. They don't take new testimony or evidence, but they look at the same evidence created at the trial level and uh, without any restrictions on the scope of the review, they will uh, make their decision. When you go to the Court of Appeals under current law, the court has a, a review what's called substantial evidence review, and that means they will look at the whole record, the same record the board looked at and the record that was made at the ALJ's level at trial. But uh, they, they have a limited scope of review. Uh, substantial evidence basically meaning that uh, they will look at the whole record and uh, Way and if there are competing, uh, confl if there's conflicting evidence on a particular point, they'll uh, uh, look at both sides of it. And as long as they determine that a reasonable person looking at both you know, viewpoints, say it's a medical question, conflicting medical uh, opinions, for example, if the court feels that a reasonable person you know, weighing both sides could have gone the way the board went in terms of deciding a certain way, that they will uphold it. So that basically means, hey. Two people might have disagreed about this, but the disagreement is reasonable, and so whatever decision the board made will be upheld. Mm -hmm. However, if the board went outside, if there wasn't some substantial evidence right. to support their the, then the, the court finance. would reverse that. Or if it's an error of law, the board you know, any any legal purely legal question. If the if the court of appeals disagrees with how the board applied the law, then they would reverse them on that. Now, this administrative law process has evolved a lot in Oregon. We have other agencies that also hold hearings, but I note there's a distinction in most of those other agencies it's someone who's applying, for, say, for government benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, and say there's a decision that someone who is on welfare is going to have the welfare benefits cut off. There you get a hearing before a hearings officer who makes a recommended decision. Uh, would it be fair to say the nature of the decision-making process is different there because the person is, in effect, recommending or drafting a proposed decision? decision for an agency director, whereas in workers' compensation what you're doing is you're independent adjudicators. You, you don't go to the director of the Department of Consumer and Business Services and ask permission to issue no. a particular decision. No, I, that's absolutely right. I mean, the board and its ALJs of the hearings division are 
adjudicating disputes basically between two private parties. You know, you don't have a situation where uh, a, some public agency has made a decision in, uh, regarding a private party's interest and they're unhappy with it so they appeal and then somebody, a hearing officer for that agency, uh, makes a review of the appeal and a recommended decision to the very same agency who uh, whose decision is being appealed in the first place. Uh, in our case, the decisions that we're reviewing are decisions by insurance companies uh, or self-insured employers to uh, denying a claim or making, or making some decision on the entitlement of benefits that the uh, worker uh, is, is looking for. And um, the representative of that entity, the, uh, be it you know, Safe Corporation, Liberty Northwest, a self-insured employer, whoever it might be, uh, their representative, lawyer that is, and uh, the claimant through their lawyer come before us and we make an independent decision. Again, just like two private parties would uh, come into circuit court and ask the judge without a jury to hear their evidence and decide their case for them. One tradition that seems to have evolved here, the reason this is still generally within the executive branch of government instead of the judicial branch uh, would be because it sort of grew up in that system where you had the old State Industrial Accident Commission. So you're still there in the executive branch, but you're performing a judicial function, really, aren't you? Well, that's the way it would seem to me. I mean, I think the evolution is, as you said, it, uh, the board evolved out of the executive branch going all the way back to creation of the system in 1916 or, or uh, but um, the function certainly since 1965 uh, the function of the board and its hearings division uh, ever since then has been uh, uh, essentially adjudicatory I mean, that's well in your role as presiding judge what do you do that's different from what the other administrative law judges do my role is more managerial it's administrative my job is to uh, uh, it's hard to explain in a few words. It, it, I don't hold here. I, I can hold hearings, and I've held uh, uh, a couple since I've taken over this job. You've done this since January of '96, if I recall. Right. I started right. doing this in January of '96, and uh, I think I've done you know, maybe it was just one hearing. Last spring, I f wanted to get back into the field, so to speak. So I, I took a hearing, assigned myself one. I've got another case now. I'll be doing a. I kind of did a kind of a quasi hearing recently we didn't have to go on the record but I'll be doing an opinion and order on it in the future I believe but so I can do those but primarily my job uh, involves the administrative functions um, I have to supervise ALJs review their work um, the statute requires once a year I have to do evaluations on on their work and uh, so I do that uh, and that's different from the trial court judge setup where circuit judges although they may be initially appointed by the governor they're ultimately elected by the vote Voters, and then they have a presiding judge, but uh, they don't get evaluated by anybody. They, the voters get to evaluate them as to whether every six years they get reelected. In the case of the administrative law judges, they're appointed. That's correct. Uh, by the board, and it's you're appointed by the board to be the presiding administrative law judge. And correct. so, it's, to put it not so gently, you ride herd over them to make sure they're minding their P's and Q's. Yeah. I, I realize that's maybe overstating it. Well, I mean, I, I guess I'd put it in a different way. My job is to is to uh, really to be, in a lot of ways, to be supportive, to make sure that they get the support they need. Uh, uh, make sure the docketing system the, works is and working are scheduled properly. Right. And my, uh, with a huge amount of help from my administrative assistant, uh, Vicki Sanders, who uh, you know, we try to make sure that uh, the docket you know, moves you know, smoothly, that uh, sometimes uh, cases have to get covered because of various uh, exigencies that come up. Uh, judge isn't available, judge gets sick. Uh, we have uh, the way we dock at cases, sometimes um, uh, the calendar for the day ends up being uh, more crowded than we had uh, thought it would be, and uh, you have to find somebody to cover a, a case. Or, um, so it's your so challenge to keep the staffing going, to keep the flow of cases going, right. make sure the judges get the appropriate level of assignments, and to also make sure that the cases are being decided in a timely fashion, probably also right. to deal with any complaints about the system and that sort when of thing. We, yeah, well, and, you know, like any system, some people can be dissatisfied about one thing or in other times and that's part of my job if a complaint does come in about something that's happening is to either try and resolve it myself or figure out who I need to go to to uh, 
uh, address the problem. Uh, a couple other things that are involved in the last couple of years in, in my job is, is trying to, is being involved in coordinating our mediation program and our OROSHA kind of sub-program. That's the safety cases, and then the mediation is when you try to help resolve differences without exactly. having a formal hearing. Yeah, which is something we've moved into uh, fairly uh, heavily in the last couple of years. Well, I'm glad that you have done that. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to talk about yeah. that piece because we've run out of time. But thank you so much for being with us on the program. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And thank you to our audience for joining us on the Kevin Mannix Report. Take care.